Living, He loved me. Dying, He saved me. Buried, He carried my sins far away. Rising, He justified freely forever. A husband and wife were both golf fanatics were discussing the future as they sat by a warm fireplace. Dear, the wife said, if I died, would you remarry? Now most men should see a danger sign flashing, but he walks right into it. The husband responds, well, if something were to happen to you in the near future, I guess so. After all, we're not exactly senior citizens. Would you live in this house with her, the wife asked? I would think so. She continued, what about my car? Would she get that? I don't see why not. Well, what about my golf clubs? Would you give them to her too? Oh, goodness gracious, no, never, the husband exclaimed. She's left-handed. This morning, I just want to give a few words of encouragement. There's a lot happening here in the congregation now. And I believe that this is the beginning of some wonderful, wonderful things that are going to happen here at Holy Trinity. People are seeing visions. We're seeing angels. We're seeing heaven opened up in front of us. And people are being transformed by the presence of the, and the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we grow in Him, as individuals and as a congregation, we're going to see more of that. Much, much more. More, greater things are yet to come. And that should excite us all. This is what we've been praying for and waiting for for such a long time. As I mentioned a few weeks ago, um, I was listening to, to prophecies for 2018 and and they're all very similar, and one of them in particular struck me, and this man said, I think it was Hank Kuhneman who said, uh, 2018 will be a year of interruption, a year of divine interruption. And what, what the Lord is saying to us there is that things are not going to be as they were. Many of us, most of us, if not all of us, have been struggling in areas of our lives. And I believe that God is going to come this year with a divine interruption and stop that. And start restoring and renewing and doing what God, what only God can do. God is intervening in the life of the church. He's intervening against the works of the enemy. The things that you and I have been praying for for so long will be manifested and quickly. More is coming much more, greater, greater things. It's time for us to be expectant to receive these blessings. So what is God up to? This, of course, it's a new path for us. We don't know what's ahead. We look at the disciples. We often think that it would have been wonderful to follow Jesus around all the time. And yeah, it would have. But if you look at what the disciples were doing at this time, I think they were fairly clueless on where Jesus was taking them most of the time, weren't they? I mean, he takes them off to the Gadarenes. They land on the shore, and there's these two guys that are demon-possessed, screaming and shouting, living in the tombs naked. And I'm sure they're like, Okay, um, maybe we should get back on the boat. We'll go back over to Galilee. You take care of this, Jesus, and let us know how it turns out. They're in a boat. And the storm is, is all coming and everything, and Jesus, he's sleeping in the back. What's going on here? Jesus is preaching to a large crowd, not once, but twice. Twice. And they've been away from their homes for a couple of days. They have no food. They come, the disciples come to Jesus and say, these people are hungry. And Jesus says, you feed them. What? Me? They 
had no idea what he was going to do next. And it was the same after his ascension. In Luke 24, 49, Jesus says, Behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus says, wait. And they have no idea what they're waiting for. They know something good's coming. They know that it's going to be power because Jesus said it was going to be power, but, you know, I'm sure they sat around and said, well, what are we going to do while we're waiting? What's going to happen? The only thing they knew is to follow him. And that's all we need to know. You see, you and I are receiving the promise of God right now, the things that he has promised this congregation. As a congregation, as, an, as individuals, transformation, <coughs> healing, joy, and most of all, his presence. So let's talk a couple minutes for what the disciples did while they waited. In Luke 24, 53, we read, they were continually in the temple blessing God. They worshiped while they were waiting. See, waiting for, on the Lord is not a passive thing. Waiting on the Lord is seeking Him and seeking His will. It's being in His presence. It's coming to Him. So they were worshiping Him. I want to talk, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I want to talk about worship. And I've talked about this before. Worship is just so critical in our lives with God. In particular, I'm talking about the songs that we sing. Yes, our entire service is a song of worship, or is, is an act of worship. Our lives should be an act of worship. But in particular, when we sing to him, there is something that happens. There's, there's this connection that happens heart to heart as God imparts to us what his desires are, where we get to um, experience his heart, experience his love experience who he is. Worship gives us an opportunity to gaze into heaven just a little bit. To see what's happening in heaven. That's one thing that, and forgive me Stacy, but that's one thing that Stacy's vision was. She got a glimpse of what was happening in heaven. Worship is an opportunity for us to open our hearts to him, to pour out our love to him, and this is what transforms us. Because when we worship Him, when we connect with Him heart to heart, He comes. His presence comes. And we're changed. We're transformed. And then in Acts 1.14, we read that all these with one accord were devoted, devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and His brothers. They came together as a congregation in prayer. In prayer and worship and seeking the Lord. They didn't know what was coming. They just knew that they were going to receive power from on high. They didn't know what it was look, would look like. And when it came, they probably were a little surprised. Hey, Peter, there's this tongue of fire over your head. What's up with that? They didn't know what was coming, but they knew that it was Jesus. They knew to follow him. And that's all we need to know. We're in the same place right now. And I think in our Christian lives, we spend a lot of time there, don't we? We're never sure exactly what God is going to do. But the disciples trusted him and wanted whatever he had for them because they knew it was good. There was this old country doctor who would take his dog along with him when he was visiting patients. The dog would remain outside while the doctor went in for the house call. On one occasion, the physician went to the home of a man with a terminal disease who didn't seem to have much time to live. The man confessed to the doctor his fears about death and said, what's it like when you die? 
The doctor thought for a moment, then got up and opened the front door. His loyal canine friend, who had been waiting patiently on the porch, gleefully bounded in to join his master. The doctor turned to the dying man and said, Do you see this dog? He didn't have any idea what was on this side of that door. All he knew that was that his master was there and he wanted to be with him. That's how I feel about death, the doctor said. I really don't know all the what's and how's about dying. I'm not totally sure what's on the other side of that door. But I know who is there and that's enough for me. I'm looking forward to being with my master. We are never sure what the future holds. We just know that our master is there. And that's enough. When the disciples received direction from the Lord at his ascension, they waited. And they waited by pressing in. They prayed. They worshipped while they were waiting. And I think that's what the Lord is saying to us. Press in. Pray. Worship. Seek my face. So again, I want to encourage you. God is doing amazing things here at Holy Trinity, and we're going to see more. And again, Stacy, I'm going to embarrass you, but this was just so cool. You remember Stacy's vision. That was a gift to us. And I've thought about this, and, and you know, whenever God does something, I'm always just amazed, and people tell me constantly, and... I love it, but I never know how to respond, you know? Because God is just so God, and he's just so cool, and he does such amazing things, and words don't express what he's doing. But why would he show this to us? Have you ever wondered? Why a vision of heaven? Why, with the same week that I talk about Billy Graham and his death, and the vision that the woman had of him in heaven, and Stacy's vision that lines up with that, why would he show us that? I mean, I didn't know Donald Jr. personally. Most of you did. Most of you, well, you would know that he's going to be in heaven. He was a godly man. So why would God show us that? It's to show us that he is active in our lives. That he's real. That even the little things he wants to be involved in. That he loves us. That's what that was for, I believe. And also assurance that someday, those of us who have received Christ will join him. This is just the tip of the iceberg. Now as God's presence increases, so does our responsibility and our accountability. Remember the story of Ananias and Sapphira? It's a really chilling, uncomfortable story, isn't it? What did they do? They didn't seem to do anything so bad, did they? They had land. They sold it. They came to Peter at the church and they said, we sold this land, we want to give the money to you. Only they kept some of it for themselves, which is fine. But they lied. That's all they did. Now, how many people in the world nowadays do you think lie to the church? And how many of them are struck dead? What's the point? The point is, at that time, God was moving very powerfully. So with increased power in the church, with increased presence in the church, comes increased responsibility and increased accountability. You and I represent him to the world. Our character is on display to the world. We are to be reflecting Christ-likeness in all that we do. You have great influence in the world. You may not realize it. You carry the Holy Spirit within you. God himself, the third person of the Trinity within you. When we receive Christ, this wonderful transformation occurs where our spirits, which are dead, are fused with the life-giving spirit of God Almighty, and we become new creations. 
At that moment, God comes to dwell in us. That gives you and I great influence in the world. And that influence will increase as his presence increases. One of, another thing that is important as we go through this time of transition is that we live lives of continual gratitude. Live lives of thankfulness. We have much to be thankful for, don't we? We have troubles, but we have much to be thankful for. In these last days, darkness in the world will increase, but so much more will the light. And you carry that light. The church, Holy Trinity, will shine brighter than ever before. And there will be great fear in the world. There is fear out there now. Things are being shaken. Everything is being shaken. People, don't, people who don't know the Lord don't know what to stand on. They don't know what to grasp. But for those of us who keep our eyes on the Savior, those of us who are in Christ, have peace. There's no need for us to fear. As we walk forth into the unknown, we know that our Master is there, just waiting behind the door. We must remember to wait on the Lord, that it's not a passive action. Remember the disciples waiting on the Lord after his command to stay in the city, praying and worshiping, seeking him, pressing in. That's our call. Lord, if it's you, we want it. Press in for deeper intimacy. Moses. There's this amazing chapter in Exodus, chapter 33. This is where Moses says, I want to see your face. And God says, you can't see my face, but you can see me from behind. Well, Moses starts this out and he says, Therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. He wants to know God's ways. He wants to know the way God thinks. He wants to know God's character. In Psalm 103, which was our psalm today, we read that God made his ways known to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. There's a difference there. The people of Israel knew God by what he did, by his miracles, which are wonderful. Moses knew him by his ways who he was, his character. They were friends. You and I have been given that same privilege of being a friend of God, knowing his ways, not just his works, but his ways, his character, his heart, the way he thinks, his heart for the lost, his heart for us, his heart for wholeness for each of us and for those in the world. In Micah 4.2, we read, Many nations will come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us about his ways and that we may walk in his paths. From Zion will go forth the law, even the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. So, in conclusion, let's seek to know the ways of God, his desires, Let's come to him in humility, in neediness, if you will. Neediness and, and humility are related. We know we need him. Let's come to him hungry for him. And the wonderful thing is that the Lord always responds to hunger. When we reach out to him, when we desire more of him, even if it's out of unpure ways. And I have known many, many people who, who have sought the Lord for, I don't, I, unpure is not the right word, but um, for a selfish reason or 
just for their own need, whatever it is, and he responds. The Lord always responds to hunger. And hunger is closely related to humility, knowing that we need God for everything. So let's humbly approach him, praying for more of him, seeking him, worshiping him, seeking his face. God the Father Almighty is your friend. He wants to know you deeply, intimately, personally. He wants to share his heart with you. Amen. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away. Justify freely forever.